Welcome everyone to the 92nd Street Y and happy birthday, ADL. Uh, 100 years of the Anti-Defamation League, that's 100 years of hate and bias and discrimination, and that existed even before the ADL. Uh, to discuss this legacy of the ADL, uh, its continued future re relevance, which we're always hoping for, for this, during this next century, um, and, it, and whether it still mains tr maintains true to its core mission, we have a very interesting panel of guests here to both celebrate and to revisit uh, the ADL's history. First, the longtime director of the ADL, Abe Foxman. <laughs> There are a few Jews in a Jewish audience that you don't, you don't need an introduction for, and that's one. It's Elie Wiesel and Abe Foxman. <laughs> and of course, three esteemed journalists who have covered uh, bias crimes and international relations and uh, the very core themes of the ADL itself, and have quoted Abe Foxman many times. First, the lovely Judy uh, uh, Miller. Uh, who uh, many people know is a uh, Pulitzer Prize winning journalist for the New York Times in her coverage of global terrorism. Um, she presently works for a number of media outlets including the Wall Street Journal and the LA Times. She appears on television very often, whether it's for uh, Chris Matthews or, or uh, you have been on Chris Matthews, haven't you? Not recently, I work for Fox <laughs> News. And I was gonna say, I was going to say, <laughs> She's one of the few people, and Fox News, and she's one of the few people who appears on both shows. Uh, but it's really just Fox News. Uh, Judith Miller. Uh, Jonathan Part Horitz, uh, who lives, has lived just a John. very, very Jewish charming. John. Very. No, no, thin. In high no school, he was known as J-Pod. You're the fame. Yeah. In high school, they called him J-Pod. Uh, but he's lived a very charmed life, this Jonathan Podhoritz. John. Uh, let's just go through it. <laughs> uh, right now, he's the editor for Commentary Magazine. We've known that for many years. And for many years before that, he was the columnist, political columnist for the New York Post. He's a co-founder of the Weekly Standard. Um, and uh, he is uh, uh, um, oh, uh, 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 been a speechwriter in two Republican administrations, or just really one? one but one, yeah, one. Reagan. A consultant on the West Wing, and was it a five-time Jeopardy champion? Yeah. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Jonathan Podhoritz, John, John Life. John, John, it's John Podhoritz. <laughs> it's very, it's very, it's, it's, it's John. Very formal. <laughs> and of course, Richard Cohen, the longtime political correspondent and columnist for the Washington Post who always has interesting things to say, and he's not going to disappoint us tonight, Richard Cohen. All right, there is so much to talk about, and I think we just have like an hour and 15 minutes, so we'll try to do as much as we can, but it's going to be interesting. Take notes, it'll be fun. Um, let's start with Abe. Abe, what are you most proud of when you think of 100 years of the Anti-Defamation League? Whoa. Uh. It's very difficult to find one single thing. But if you were to say to me, name one thing that the ADL has done that has had the greatest impact in changing attitudes and hatred and bigotry, I would say it's uh, drafting legislation in the 1950s in the state of Georgia called the Anti-Mask Law. Under our Constitution, um, the First Amendment guarantees you the right to be a bigot. Uh, but at the same time, what we've tried to teach America, set as a standard, you can be a bigot, but you have to take responsibility for your bigotry. The anti-mask law said to the Ku Klux Klan, you want to be bigots? You want to burn crosses? You want to burn um, stars of David? Let's see who you are. Remove that mask. And that one single piece of legislation, which was challenged, challenged by the ACLU and others throughout the years, where the Supreme Court felt that it was nine to nothing, that it was constitutional. It's probably the one single act that the ADL, we drafted it, we advocated, we defended it, 
which had the greatest impact on turning the clock to begin to undo uh, the bigotry and the racism, but more so the intimidation and the fear uh, that the Ku Klux Klan and their followers had. So that's, I would say that's the most single significant act. Let's turn to our journalists. Uh, you have all quoted Abe, no doubt, in stories over the years. And you've also invoked the ADL in your stories for the spokesperson or spokes event for, for whatever fact that you were citing. Um, it is interesting in a way that it appears that Abe is often quoted for stories that look like it's outside his strike zone. Things that deal with, uh, you know, even Jewish elections per se, or Jewish art, for instance, you know, whether it, you know, life is beautiful is a good example of things that people ask Abe Foxman's opinion. So I'm not saying, I'm not actually saying he's like king of the Jews. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. I'm, I'm, I, but I am wondering. You know what happened for the last year? Right. <laughs> I'm not saying it exactly like that, but it does seem that he's quoted often uh, when it comes to all things Jewish. And I wonder whether that confuses people about what the ADL even is. Well, I don't. Actually, my primary interaction with Abe was uh, when I started covering Arabs and Muslims for the New York Times when I was assigned to uh, Egypt as the Cairo correspondent. And the first person whom I spoke to after 9-11, because of his extraordinary ties in the Arab and Muslim world, hmm. was Abe Foxman. And my concern was, his, which was how do we stop uh, kind of suspicion and hatred of Muslims because of what had happened in our city in 9-11 from spreading. And so, weirdly enough, I came to Abe through Islam, <laughs> which I don't think a lot of people in the room can say. <laughs> you've, you've had an actually interesting <laughs> history with Islam. Uh, you, Abe, I think were perhaps the first person after the first World Trade Center bombing who came out and called attention to anti-Muslim uh, bigotry and scapegoating uh, against Muslims. I mean, people forget that the first attack on the World Trade Center took place a de almost a decade earlier, and that was the very first instance in which there was a connection made between Islam and terrorism. Yeah, and also, I guess, the, the, the 9-11, I think one of the more difficult but yet proudest moments of the ADL was an ad that we took in the New York Times which said, you do not fight hatred with hatred. Mm -hmm. That means it's one thing to put the blame where it belongs, mm -hmm. and it belongs fundamentalist Islam, extremist Islam. But God forbid if we were to then uh, talk about Islam and Muslims in America. And so yeah, we, we're involved in both, in exposing, um, in educating about, and yet at the same time when necessary to stand up and embrace. If there were three journalists here who were not identified with the Jewish world and weren't Jews themselves, would they say, or would others say, that the ADL has stood up for uh, Asian Americans and African Americans against racial bias and ethnic bias and gender discrimination in the same way that it's identified as a protector of Jews? You asking me? I'm asking everybody. Does everyone feel that the ADL is a, is a, is a fair partner in the fight I think, against discrimination? I think that's a very peculiar question. The ADL is a Jewish fraternal organization whose purpose, like Jewish fraternal organizations, is the defense and protection of the Jewish community against threats against it. It is a particular kind of threat. It is a world historical threat. It is a unique type of threat, and it is perfectly defensible for there to be Jewish organizations concerned specifically, indeed even exclusively, with the threats to the Jewish community now perhaps more than ever. Interestingly enough, when you asked your first question about whether, you know, why it was that Abe was asked questions about life is beautiful and other cultural matters, it's because the nature and the problem of of anti-Semitism and Jew hatred, particularly in the United States, has undergone a metamorphosis over the last hundred years from explicit 
legislation and policies that were discriminatory, explicitly discriminatory against Jews that had to be altered and changed and fought. Now those are gone. And so the question then is, what are the prevailing cultural attitudes, political, socio-cultural attitudes, that represent an extension of that kind of hatred much more, um, you know, it's much more evanescent, it's less a direct threat to any individual Jew's livelihood or, uh, you know, sort of condition of life, but it does create the conditions under which people become more and more uh, accepting of certain types of attitudes that over time could create the conditions for uh, a renewal of anti-Semitic feeling, not just here, but you know, elsewhere, that, is, that poses a direct threat to Jews. In the United States, there, I would say, is very little in the way of direct threat toward Jews. That is clearly not the case in Western Europe now, where there is a wild advance in particular physical threats to Jews in Paris and Sweden, uh, a little bit in London, though not as bad. And Jews, first and foremost, if we do not speak, if we do not stand up for ourselves, for our brethren, for the assaults against them, who will? We are not obliged as a community to direct our energies specifically and first toward the difficulties of others. We must take care of ourselves and then we can take care of others. Uh, John. <clears throat> Way to stir the pot, John. John, um, we're a long way from a fraternal organization. We're 100 years old. We were established by the B'nai B'rith of fraternal organization. But, um, there's an there's a amendment of, of how you see it. The founders uh, of the ADL set in 1913, when you think about it then, 100 years ago, a dual mission. And the mission was two pillars. Fight the defamation of the Jewish people, which is interesting. 100 years ago, they were a little bit squeamish about even using the word anti-Semitism and to uh, fight for equal opportunity for all citizens alike. It was a dual mission. It's always been a dual mission, and what, based on half, half of the phrase that you used, we use the full phrase, it's im ena nili mili, if I am not for myself, who will be? But if I'm an ilak, that's me, mani, but if I'm only for myself, what am I? And it's always been this dual mission purpose, partially because that's our teaching, but also because it was very, very selfish. And I'll conclude by saying to you, if, if we ever forget how tied bigotry is, I remember the summer of, uh, it was called the, the summer of hate. And one summer, I believe it was in 1999, uh, America and the American Jewish community experienced two manifestations of, of violent hate. One was in Chicago. In Chicago, an anti-Semite on a Friday night went out to burn synagogues. On the way, he passed a jogger. The jogger happened to be a coach at Northwestern. He happened to be African-American. So on the way to towards synagogues on Friday night, he killed uh, the coach because he was African-American. Two weeks later, on a, on a summer day in Los Angeles, another anti-Semite went out to do damage to hurt Jewish kids at a day school, at a day camp. I all remember this picture of 10 Jewish kids uh, escorted by policemen. On the way to the daycare center, he passed a post postal worker who happened to be Filipino, and he killed her. And to us, this is a stark reminder that bigotry is so close. And, and so our mission, I don't know what your answer is to Thane's question, but for us, it's been very clear. You can't fight one without the other, and we need each other in, in an effort to, to make America more respectful and more civil. So would other groups say that the ADL has stood up for them? You should ask them. The answer is yes. Um, <laughs> certainly those groups that uh, 
that celebrate us, and some do. Um, the NAACP at one time saw us as an enemy because we're opposed to affirmative action. Right. Um, so, you know, some uh, Muslim American groups uh, misinterpreted our raising our issues on, on the mosque at ground zero. Um, you want to so, talk about that today, too. I want to come back to that. Fine, too. okay. Yeah. So that I think on the whole, we have been celebrated as coalition partners, as having stood up for uh, other minorities very clearly. We were in uh, Brown versus Board of Education. Amicus brief. Amicus brief. We were there in the court when it wasn't that popular. We were fighting Jim Crow. We were for civil rights legislation in the, in the 50s when we had Jewish communities in the South who were asking us, shut, steal. And yet we, we said, this is where America needs to go and where the Jewish community needs to go. But I, I think on the whole, an honest appraisal is we were there and we continue to be there, but there are some who either don't think it's enough or don't like our positions on other issues. In getting ready for the evening, I had forgotten the, the connection between the Leo Frank case and the growth of the ADL. I don't want to spend a lot, a lot of time talking about it, but it's clear that the original founders of the ADL were profoundly, in the way that I think John would agree, were profoundly moved by this pogrom in Atlanta against this one Jewish manager of a pencil factory uh, who was taken out of his prison, Jewish fellow from, I think he was from New York City. Yeah. He went to the South to manage his family's pencil factory. He was uh, uh, wrongfully accused of raping a 13-year-old girl. It actually was a, uh, was, I think it was an African-American janitor who actually had committed the crime. Uh, he was immediately convicted. Uh, his, the, the governor of Georgia commuted the sentence. And there was such uh, animus about the fact that this Jewish person would escape the death penalty that he was yanked out of the prison and lynched that night. Uh, and that, in some ways, gave birth to the ADL. Well, it, it, it woke up. There was a group of lawyers in the Chicago office who, who uh, started the ADL. I think they came to the realization that even in this golden in Medina, uh, Jews can be, people can be killed <coughs> because of who they are and Jews are not excluded. And I think it was a traumatizing event that uh, basically said to them they need, Jews need an organization, a defense organization, to stand up through legislation, litigation when necessary um, to fight. Not, yeah, I'm not sure how much of it is apocrypha and how much is real, but the trauma to the American Jewish community of that lynching uh, was profound. It was very much like an uh, American Dreyfus affair, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, and by the way, it took us 60 years to get him a pardon. Right. Mm -hmm. Right, but that, and actually you, you the ADL spearheaded <laughs> that. that. Right. So then there's this, uh, say there's a yet another confusion. So the ADL is perceived, understood as being an organization dedicated to fighting racism and discrimination and bias. Uh, on the other hand, it's a very, very strong Israel advocacy organization, and you're oftentimes quoted and asked to speak about that. There seems to be two different missions there, a separate mission that's connected to that. We have three, three journalists. We're going to talk about a number of issues related to Israel. I want to start maybe with Richard. Um, and I, since we have three journalists, we'll just say, do you think that the press is fair to Israel? And do you think, and we'll come back to you, uh, Abe, whether or not sometimes you're asked to comment on whether there is uh, fairness in the way that Israel's policies are depicted in the media? Well, I don't mean to hog the mic, but... Um, <laughs> uh, uh, I was trying to work you in. Well, I, uh, <laughs> I, I had all my Richard Cohen questions. I, I was like, I, I do a little dancing, uh, and I can sing. Is the press fair? To, well, first of all, I don't know what the press is. I've always had a problem with that, because I don't know if you're talking about the New York Times and the Washington Post or other newspapers or Fox TV or what. I would say, overall, the press is fair to Israel. I would say the trouble with Israel is, in this regard, is that it's got too much press. Everything gets covered. And Everybody has a bureau there, and it used to be, particularly if you were stationed in Israel, you'd have, you couldn't leave Israel. You couldn't get out of the country. You couldn't go to the next door to, to Jordan or up to Syria or Lebanon, whatever. So you reported on everything in Israel, and Israel got reported in the most important newspapers in the country and also on the networks. So a lot of bad stuff got reported, a lot of good stuff 
didn't get reported after a while because it got to be routine. Nobody does a story saying, wow, it's a democracy, you know. Wow, look at this, we got a symphony orchestra, you know, wow. I mean, we've got, uh, you know, we, we're doing great nuclear research, we're doing great scientific research. This, the good news in, in general doesn't get reported, no matter what it's about. So Israel suffers on that accord, but I don't think it's being covered unfairly. I think it may suffer from the faults inherent in journalism, which is always to report bad news. News is bad. News is out of the ordinary. News is something that's happened that's wrong. I remember one time Walter Cronkite saying, news is not that 3,000 kids went to Thomas Jefferson High School, went to the first period class, second period class, third period, fourth period class, and went home. News is that one of them killed the principal. And, <laughs> and so you're stuck with that kind of, that's human nature, and so we all, we all hear the bad news. That's it, I'm going home now. <laughs> <laughs> I'd, like to, uh, I'd like to interrupt Richard. Uh, <laughs> Again. <laughs> if I could. Uh, every time he speaks, I'm going to do that just to, you know, just to keep things lively. Say what you will, Jonathan. Uh, <laughs> thank you very much. Now he's going to call him Dick. <laughs> um, I think again, uh, the, 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 there's a deep fallacy in your question, which is, if you have an organization that is dedicated to fighting bigotry, intolerance, and hatred of Jews, the focus on Israel is the essential focus of our time. And this year, this moment, now more than ever with an irredentist regime in Tehran that is threatening the annihilation of a nation in which more, there are now more Jews living in Israel than, any, than, than there are in the rest of the world combined. Um, and that is a, the, the threat against Israel is, an, is a directly ideologically anti-Semitic threat. It's not a realpolitik question about Israel's position in the Middle East. It is, this is a cancer that must be expunged and it will go away soon, and it will be destroyed, and this is rhetoric being used by a country that is racing to get a nuclear weapon. And focus and clarity about that and the threat to Israel, the rhetorical threat to Israel, not only the military threat to Israel, but the creation of committees that wish to create economic boycott and divestment in Israel, uh, for, pre for following a, a unique among the nations on the earth uh, because it is a Jewish state and the notion that Jews are not permitted to have their own state is itself a racist notion, uh, an anti-nationalist racist notion that Jews, again, I'm delighted that the ADL has a dual mission to fight bigotry and to fight uh, Jew hatred but the fact is that Jew hatred is a focus and must be a focus of the Jewish community first. If it is not, it is not just who, if I am not for myself, who will be for me. That question is not simply a plaint and a plea to the heavens, it is a literal fact. If Jews do not care about the fate of Jews, non-Jews are not gonna care about the fate of Jews. If Jews do not say that the salvation of Israel is the most important thing that will keep this oldest monotheistic religion and the, and, the, and the fundament of Western civilization alive, if Jews do not say that is the primary focus of our civilization at the present time, non-Jews will not think that. That is not their birthright. That is not, the, it is their birthright, but it is not their direct birthright. And without that, there will be a withering away of the pressure, a withering away of the necessity for the focus, a withering away of an understanding that Jews have a unique uh, threat against them, have had a unique threat against them for centuries and millennia, and must combat it. In America, it was a brave thing for the Anti-Defamation League and other organizations to in a country in which the Jews were not yet fully established, in which there was a lot of institutional bias and legal bias and all that, to gather together to fight against it. It was by no means the wise or prudent decision to make because you want to keep your head down, like you said about Southern Jews. You don't make waves, don't make trouble. It's like the two Jews in front of the firing squad and someone says, is there any last request? And one says, I'd like please a blindfold and the other says, Sam, don't make trouble. 
Well, those are the two faces of the Jewish community. There's the one that wants the blindfold and the one that says don't make trouble and sometimes you gotta make trouble and organizations like the ADL make trouble and they must make trouble. Abe. Uh, Abe, John, of course, speaks to us as the editor of Commentary Magazine. Would you frame ADL's advocacy on behalf of Israel in those terms, that that's the reason why there's a direct connection between anti-discrimination and pro-Israel advocacy in the way that John framed it? I think the philosophical debate in the American Jewish community ended in the 1967 war. I think before that, there was a debate. Should we, shouldn't we? ADL history, when you look at it, we got involved with uh, boycott, anti-boycott, boycott legislation. Why? Because boycotting Israel impacted on American citizens because it discriminated against Jews who were dealing with the real. So we had this rationale that it impacts on us. I think the American Jewish community struggled for a while. But May 67, the threats to Israel's existence and the 67 war brought out this courage in the American Jewish community to stand up for Israel. If, if ADL, for example, needed a rationale, we then established the Middle Eastern Affairs Department. A couple of years later, we opened up an office in Jerusalem. It was the realization that the destruction of Israel, God forbid, would be the ultimate of anti-Semitism in our lifetime. And what has happened in the last 30 or 40 years is that Israel has become the Jew amongst the nations. And you, you know, we don't have time to go, but everything that every other nation, what other country has to defend its existence? Has to defend its legitimacy? What other country? What other country hasn't been given the right to determine what its capital is? And with this great ally in the United States not recognizing the sovereign country's decision that its capital is in Jerusalem. What other country has to defend its right to defend its citizens? So in fact, there is this, this, this looking at Israel, as you will, as the Jew. What is entitled, everybody else can do it, it's not. The issue of Zionism, and part of it you hear about, oh, I'm not against, I'm only against Zionism. Well, you know what? There may be five unique <laughs> people in the world who, who are anti-Zionist and who are not anti-Semites. You know where they are? They are those who don't like nationalism. What is Zionism? Zionism is a national liberation movement of the Jewish people, okay? If you don't like Zionism and you think it's racism, you better not like Palestinian nationalism because that's racism, or Polish, or French. So if the only nationalism that bothers you and is racist is Jewish nationalism, that's anti-Semitism. And so in a way, <laughs> the way the world is acting has made it almost to, you know, it made it so natural for an anti-defamation league, an American organization, or other American organizations, to take up the advocacy and the defense of Israel, Israel's existence, its security, its well-being, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Judy, <coughs> fair coverage of Israel by the press, by your colleagues. Now, as Richard pointed out, oftentimes this question is framed specifically about the New York Times coverage, your former employer. Uh, I don't know if you're comfortable addressing that, but the question is, as a member of the press, do you think that Israel's getting, receiving fair coverage generally? Well, I, I would agree with Richard. I, it's just, you know, we had always at the New York Times one correspondent in Israel and one correspondent in the Arab world, all 22 countries. <laughs> I mean, I spent 70% of my time out of Egypt, the most important, most populous Arab country, because I was busy covering everything else, whereas the correspondent in Israel had the luxury of kind of being there and getting to know one country. Interestingly enough, when I first started covering the Arabs and the Israelis, um, the New York Times took the position that even though we made everyone learn every other language on the face of the earth, from Polish to Chinese to Japanese to everything, there were two languages that were the exceptions. One was Hebrew and the other was Arabic. So you had two correspondents who were equally ignorant of the, of the culture, what people were really saying in both capitals. That's now changed. 
Uh, yeah, I, I, look, I think the coverage is, um, is fair, but once again, there's not enough. And there has been a sea change now. I mean, there, it, you can say, all right, for a long time, how many pictures of Hosni Mubarak can we show? But you know, in the past two years, you've had a sea change in the Arab world. I mean, that what's going on there is like nothing that I ever thought I would see in my lifetime. And I think that phenomenon is hugely undercovered in every one of the Arab Spring or Arab Awakening or whatever you want to call it, the Nakba countries, in every single one of them, there are changes that were not foreseen by anyone. And compare that to the number of stories on Israel, and you'll see a kind of bias that somehow what goes on there doesn't really matter. The thing also is um, I, I did made reporting trips to Israel, and I lost track how many times. The thing about Israel is it's easy. Mm -hmm. It's easy. I mean, you try and report in the Arab world, I mean, it's hard. I mean, it's hard. Everybody says, sure, I'll meet you at 12, and they don't show up. <laughs> in Israel, they're there. You pick up the phone in the Arab world, and nothing happens. You pick up the phone in Israel, and it works, you know. And you can get anybody on the phone, and you can have meeting after meeting after meeting. So the stories just come out of it. And, and Israelis appreciate a free press, and Israelis are so much more critical of their country than American Jews are. I mean, it's just astounding what they're willing to say. I mean, this film, uh, I forgot the name. The Gatekeepers. Gatekeepers. The Gatekeepers. I mean, <laughs> can you imagine five former directors of the CIA talking that way? I mean, it, it just couldn't happen. First of all, they'd lose their lobbying credentials overnight, so they, they couldn't make any money, you know. They'd get kicked off the board of General Dynamics and others. But, <laughs> But Israel, Israel is one big, huge conversation, and the stories just come hitting you in the face. So you can't do that any, almost anywhere else in the world. So you're saying in some ways, at least in the coverage of the Middle East, Israel suffers from transparency. You can cover it better, and therefore it can be more criticized. Transparency right. is the worst idea anybody ever came up with. <laughs> you don't want to know what goes on, right? Just, right? You know, like, it would be nice, I'm not going to get into the question of the bias of the New York Times, it would be nice if it's correspondent could write a story that didn't require eight corrections every time she files it. That's all I'm going to say. Um, Abe? One, I think one measure of the media is the influence and impact it has on public opinion. If you watch and follow public opinion on Israel, it will either Either you, the media is wonderful or it really doesn't matter if it's biased <laughs> because can, it, only three months ago it was a poll. It was the highest number of sympathy, support, and understanding of Israel vis-a-vis vis -vis the Palestinian Arab narrative. It's, it reached 70%. Uh, I don't remember it ever coming down much below 40. So the American people ha have a judgment of a sense of good and evil, friend and foe, um, who they're comfortable or not, regardless what the media really says. Look, in Europe, it's very, very different. In Europe, the media is biased, and so is, so is the public. Now, so if we were to look at the public here, if, if in Europe the media is biased and therefore the public is, therefore if the public here is not, bi is not biased, then therefore we come to the conclusion that the media here could be better. John, Jonathan, um, I write more letters to the New York Times in one year than I write to the, all the media and <laughs> newspapers and TV stations in the world, okay? And, and yet still, it hasn't impacted on the opinion of, of Americans. Now, years ago, we had, at the Washington Post, we had a representative of the Washington Jewish community sit on the foreign desk and watch as these decisions were made. How to play the stories, what stories got into the paper, everything. People on the staff were furious that Ben Bradley allowed this to happen because we don't like anybody to see how we make our omelets. You know, it's just ugly. And this, this person sat there, I think it was Michael Berenbaum, and, um, who later became the director of the Holocaust Museum. And he walked after a week and said, yeah, nothing. I mean, every decision they made made sense to him. But you will always find people who say, that's the worst story, there's a mistake here. There's, there's always a mistake. There's a mistake after mistake. I don't think that there is um, a policy. I mean, I know there's no policy. I know too many of these people. I know Judy worked there, too. 
And they wouldn't, there, there's no policy, but there are mistakes. And very often, as I said before, you report bad news. But there is opinion. Pardon? There may not be a policy, but there's strong opinion. I remember a long time ago, it was 1978, and the ADL asked for a meeting with Time Magazine. Time Magazine was horrific in terms of its coverage of Israel. And we finally got this meeting, and uh, I think it was Grunewald was the Henry editor. Grunewald. Henry Grunewald. Yeah, and he said to us, uh, I thought you people were smart. How naive can you be? And he said, we, what do you think we, we do? We sit around and we decide on a cover story. What do you think the cover story comes out of our opinion, our judgment? our biases, and then we decide how to slant it. So I was the young Pisher then. So, uh, and I said, Mr. Grunwald, do you have a copy of Time Magazine? And he said, sure. And he, and he, I said, Time, the weekly news magazine, not the opinion magazine. He says, well, everybody does that. So then again, with my chutzpah, I said, does not explain Begin rhymes with Fagin. Those of you old enough to remember when Menachem Begin was elected Prime Minister of Israel, the first sentence about Begin's election in Time magazine was, Begin rhymes with Fagin. He said, I have no defense of that. But there is opinion, and opinion does color, not only, certainly the editorial page, but sometimes even the news coverage. Judy, I don't know how many people remember uh, Judy's coverage, both for the Times and, and elsewhere, is always focused on counterterrorism and national security and, and, and global terrorism. Uh, um, people may not remember that you were once the, either the actual victim of a letter anthrax attack when you were at the New York Times. I specifically remember when I heard about it, I immediately called my friend Joe Berger, who apparently had a desk right near yours at the time. <laughs> And he said, he, heard, he said, I heard Judy scream, and we all hauled ass. That's what he said. <laughs> um, we're living in a time, and it's an interesting time, and it's a time, of course, the ADL has taken a position on, that we're supposed to balance national security with civil liberties. And Muslim community, American Muslim community, has said that we have been unfairly singled out as being responsible for global terrorism, simply because of our, who we are. Um, at the same time, we see our elected officials. This was the, 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 the Times Square attempt on the bombing. Of course, Mayor Bloomberg refused to invoke the word Islam. Uh, no one has ever really held Major Hassan, the person who was responsible for the killings at Fort Hood, as I mean, President Obama was very clear not to invoke the word Islam, that there's no connection, although he did say Al Akbar just before the machine guns went off. So how are we supposed to, on the one hand, you support uh, and- Building of mosques. Yes, you support building of mosques. And we're opposed to, to those who want to outlaw Sharia. Right. Okay. And at the same time, you know that there are people who would say, the Patriot Act has unfairly implicated people. And there are people who would say, maybe Judy Miller, surely John Podhoritz would say, no other bombs have gone off, and that matters a lot to this country, that no other buildings have come down, no subway attacks, and that we should be very grateful for that, and that, of course, over-inclusiveness may not look constitutional, but it's a hell of a lot safer, and also could be discriminatory. These are tough questions. They're tough ADL questions. They're actually political and moral questions. Um, well, we live in a, we live in a, you're a law professor, we live in an extremely litigious society, there has been no piece of legislation, no set of actions that have been taken in the United States over the past decade that have been more challenged, more, more taken to court, more focused on by the civil liberties bar um, than the Patriot Act and then associated uh, homeland security measures. Um, and as far as I can tell, in the overwhelming majority of cases, those challenges have been rejected by, by courts which are not uniformly conservative and are not uniformly, are not, you know, they're not just made up of, you know, Scalia and Thomas sitting there throwing thunderbolts at, at you know, poor defenseless, you know, Brooklynites who did, never did anything wrong. That's not the way things work. I, my take on the United States, which goes to, I think, part of the, miracle of the country and the way organizations like the ADL and others work is it's astonishing 
how little hostility, how little public uh, you know, uh, rage uh, was or has been, was expressed toward the Muslim community immediately after 9-11, how little, how, how in almost any other country in the world, legislation would have been proposed that would have been directly hostile. Um, you see uh, not just civil libertarians on the left, but a lot of people on the right who are um, enraged by efforts to paint all of Islam with this you know, disgusting, tarred brush according to which Islam is itself you know, an, uh, you know, a, a terroristic religion that is an infamy and a depredation. It's, a, a de you know, it's an infamy against a billion people. Uh, aside from everything else, even if it were true, which it is not, it would, be a, it would be a psychotic thing for the United States to act on that as a matter of policy. You know, we're not gonna win against, we're not gonna win a war against, you know, um, against a, a vibrant cultural, religious, social force like that by, by, by accusing it of being a force for evil. Um, so, uh, and I think a lot of this is that organizations like the ADL and American organizations that have dedicated themselves to fighting racism have, and fighting hostility toward minority groups um, have not allowed their ranks to be sullied by this kind of hostility. And if they had been, that would have been a kind of permission to allow a lot of other things to happen. Um, and I think the country deserves credit for that. Um, the legislation itself, I think, has been, you know, uh, validated by, by, by time, by courts, by the fact that it, most of it, you know, almost none of it has been revisited by Congress. Um, and I think uh, under those circumstances, um, there is no reason to look at this and say America has turned into a fascist country. I hate taking my shoes off at the airport as much as anybody else does. You go through, you know, you go through an airport with, you know, with your shoes off and a, th and a two and a half year old in your arms with a stroller going through and then you have to put your shoes back on while your kid is arching his back and having a tantrum. It's horrible, but there you are. So that's the inconvenience to me. Things are much more inconvenient for a lot of people and that's life. But I, I think, I think, John, I think we've maintained a balance. I think we are conscious that we need to find this balance between security and, 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 our, and our freedoms. And I think that's the beauty of America. And, and I think we're part of it. I know we're part of it. And that is, you need to find that balance. And I think it is it's a magnificent statement on America. Um, I'm not proud of one part of this equation. There are 10 times as many acts of hatred directed in the United States against Jews than there are against Muslims. Now, one is too many, right? But it does say something. There is this hysteria we feared. We took out that ad in the New York Times because we feared a hysteria against Muslim Americans. You know what? I think we've learned from what we did to the Japanese. I think we've learned from our own experiences of, of reacting in a hysterical, racist, bigoted fashion. Now, there are excesses. And, you know, and we will condemn the excesses, and others have condemned the excesses. Some of the advertising that goes on, there's a debate now on the buses here. You know what? We stand up and say this is racist, even though it, you don't have to support Israel and hate Muslims, okay? Not, it, it, one doesn't necessarily, uh, it's, it's not a compliment of the other. I think what we continue to need is to have the ability, sometimes the courage, to stand up and say, hey, this isn't to help American security. This is racist, even if it comes from our own community. But you know, there was one other thing, and that is right after 9-11, George, George W. Bush went to the mosque right. in, in Washington. Right. And I thought that was an extraordinary symbolic moment of political leadership, the kind of political leadership that has often been lacking in other countries, but in America, it was, it was a good thing he did, and, and it just, you know, I think it made a big difference. But, you know, Abe said something very important, and it's what Always. gets back to the focus, which is people do not know that this is the case. This is the FBI hate crime stats. 
10 times as many hate crimes are committed against Jews than against Muslims. More hate crimes are committed against Jews than against any other group in the United States. Jews make up 2% of the population and 10 or 12% of the hate crimes in the United States. Now, Jews are not a threat. I don't think any of us feels like, you know, we're walking down the street and something terrible is going to happen to us. But go to Malmo, Sweden. In Malmo, Sweden, the mayor of Malmo, Sweden, told Jews not to wear kippot. They said in Lyon, France, the mayor of Lyon, France said, Jews shouldn't wear kippot. Should, Jews should wear no external sign of their faith if they don't want to get injured by youths. This is 2013 in Europe. 75 years, you know, it's been, what has it been since, since, since the Holocaust? It's almost 70, you know, 68 years since the, whole, since the world found out about the Holocaust. And in Europe, Jews are being told to hide their identities lest they be placed under physical threat. This is a horrifying fact. This is a nightmare we are, we are entering into that is not being adequately challenged by the governments in those countries, by the, by the law enforcement in those countries, um, and by the intelligentsia, which gets to the point about the press. I mean, however much I want to complain about the New York Times, and I'd be happy to till, till 3 o'clock in the morning, <laughs> it is nothing compared to the, to the systematic effort in Europe to hide the fact that the, Jew, the tiny sliver of Jews left in Europe is increasingly at risk for the crime of being Jewish. That cannot be allowed to be ignored, and we need organizations like the ADL and others to talk about it incessantly. I mean, magazines like mine, my website, my magazine, we talk about it all the time, but that, that, that is one effort among many, and if we don't do it, the world will not know of it. Let's talk about... John will be selling copies of commentary after tonight. <laughs> I'm sure we're already already subscribers. Um, let's talk about some moments in recent uh, history uh, where the ADL has had to take public positions. Uh, two that I'll jo can join uh, because they're similar in some ways is the uh, uh, two books: the book by Walt, Mersheim, Walt and Mersheimer's book on the Israeli lobby, in which he assent they essentially attribute an uh, uh, excess of uh, power uh, wielded by uh, American Jews disproportionate to their numbers and also even more importantly their hijacking of foreign policy in contravention of what's in the best interest of the United States um, and of course former President Jimmy Carter's book in which he uh, identifies uh, Israel with an apartheid state. Uh, these were Great stories, big stories, and required a very both strong and measured responses to both. Uh, any, Abe actually wrote a book that actually responded, but any of any of the other other responses, to Richard? I responded to both, okay. but, di but differently. Um, I thought Jimmy Carter made it. I mean, I thought using the term apartheid was insulting and revolting and shouldn't have done it. And I think he regretted it afterwards because he realized it just colored this whole. His whole discussion, uh, it just, it just, and it tainted him. Um, Good. But uh, <laughs> I, uh, I thought, what, 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 uh, Carter's, Carter's the guy who's responsible for the Camp David agreement, so, you know, just keep things in mind here. Uh, I thought the, the Mirsh, Walt and Mirsheim book, I thought they were, it was okay. I mean, they, they had something to say about it. I didn't think it was necessarily anti-Semitic. I think afterwards, I think it's Mearsheimer, I don't remember which one it is, has said, I, I, again, I'm confused. One is at the University of Chicago. Chicago. I that's think it's Chicago, that, that's Mearsheimer. Mearsheimer is at Chicago. I think since then, he's gone off the deep end and said some really uh, ugly things. But the book about the Israeli, uh, pro-Israeli lobby, I mean, it, there is a pro-Israeli lobby. It's true, and it's very powerful. It is extremely powerful. It may not be as powerful as the NRA now, but it is. <laughs> it, 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 it matters, and it has made a difference in, in, in American politics. I spent, I don't know, 20-something years in Washington, and it is just a given that you have to be, watch out for the, for the pro-Israeli lobby. I mean, some people vote you know, that way because they feel it. Some people vote that way because they just don't want to get into trouble with the Israeli, the Israeli lobby, but it exists. And I thought all the people who screamed and said, it's not the Israeli, it's not there, it's not there, just not telling the truth. It's just not realistic. It exists, 
I think, I think it, it, it exists in, and Jews ought to be proud of it because uh, it has a great deal of influence, a great deal of clout, and because Jews are a little less than 2% of the American population now diminishing, but they keep their political clout, and that's something to be proud of, and, and, and it's something that does, it's good for Israel. Richard, it's not, uh, their book was not about clout and influence. Their book was about a canard of control. Their book about was not, listen, <laughs> there's the oil lobby, all right? There's the Saudi, there are a lot of lobbies, and they're influential, et cetera. Their book was not an applause. Take a look how influential the Jews are, how significant the no, Jews no, 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 are. No, 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 no. There was I, a canard to say. Now, it has a conclusion. It's, it, it is an anti-Semitic conclusion. And the conclusion is that the Jews control American foreign policy, that they dictate, that the Jews forced, forced connived to America to go to war in Iraq. Okay? So it was not a benign discussion of Israel lobbying. Okay, take a look. It was a very clear charge. And, and, and Mr. Carter, who embraced it and applauded it and gave it credi more credibility, um, that's, that's classic anti-Semitism. Um, you know, Richard, we, we take polls. We take the pulse of the American people. Um, we've come a long way in social and in fighting social anti-Semitism. There was a time Jews couldn't live in places and work in places and, and go to school. Today, Jews can go anywhere, live anywhere, et cetera. We made a tremendous progress in, in the classic sense of social anti-Semitism. But in one area, something in this country has not changed in 40 years since we've been polling. One out of three Americans believes to this day, 31%, that American Jews are more loyal to Israel, the United States. That's political anti-Semitism. That goes back to the protocols of the learned elders. Of you can't trust the Jews. They only care about themselves. Now take your choice about money. Jews want money so they can control, have power, or they want power so they can have money. That's what they were talking about. I wrote a book called The Deadliest Lies, because these are the lies, the canards, that led to the death of Jews. If we're not to be trusted, and that's what they were saying, don't trust those Jews. They control Congress, the White House. It wasn't to applaud our influence and our wisdom. I didn't say that they were applauding it. I just said we ought to applaud it. We ought to acknowledge that such a thing exists as a pro-Israeli lobby, and I have no problem with it. I'm not embarrassed with it or whatever it is. But every time AIPAC has a convention, the president comes, the vice president comes, the secretary of state comes, everybody comes. Do they come to the Armenians? I mean, what do you think is going on yeah, here? Whoever, yeah, I mean, come on. Whoever, whoever said there wasn't an Israeli lobby and that AIPAC oh, right. wasn't, okay. wasn't, right. wasn't you know, powerful and effective? It's an extraordinarily effective organization. Right. It's not we, so effective that, you know, I mean, it's not so effective that... Uh, that it dictates policy. Yeah, it really doesn't dictate policy in any uh, way, shape, or form. I, I However, know. having said that, you know, the key stat in the United States is the stat that Abe mentioned, which is that polling suggests that somewhere between 63 and 70 percent of the American public expresses support for Israel compared to 9 to Because the Jews control the media. Of, right, yeah. The Zionists yeah. control the Hall media. I, if only, it, if <laughs> only it, you know, if that were the case, maybe my magazine would have a much larger circulation. Than that. <laughs> but all I'm saying is that, you know, the key to understanding the support for Israel in the United States, which has grown by leaps and bounds since the 1970s, I have to say, in a room where everybody gets all crazy about this, is the rise of evangelical Christian support for Israel. The rise of the evangelicals. Evangelicals are passionately pro-Israel. That number, the number, the, the, the growth in American support for Israel is based in the strength of evangelical Christianity. I would say that, you know, they are more important uh, in terms of ballasting congressional support for Israel than APAC is, uh, and, and, and have been for many decades before, if you go back to the late 70s, before evangelical Christianity really had its rise, half the Senate could have been characterized, easily half the Senate, and far more of the Republican senators could have been characterized as tilting toward the Arabs than tilting toward Israel. That was the, 
classic foreign policy position of the Republican Party that, that Israel was, you know, that, that we had a great many more allies in the Middle East who were Arab and the Arabs oil. had the oil and realpolitik dictated that America should support this. And Israel was a socialist country and it wasn't, and you know, the, the, the Soviets had, had supported its creation at the same time, so they really weren't great friends of ours. And that transition from that position, particularly among Republicans in the Republican caucus in the House and Senate, to an almost uniform support is one of the little noted things. When, as we know, you know, 70 to 80 percent of American Jews vote Democratic, that is a very key fact that everybody has to understand. Well, congratulations. I'm glad you're really happy about that. You should only enjoy, really. <laughs> because it gives me heartburn, but you, you should enjoy. <laughs> Abe, am, am I, do I recall correctly that at some, you've at, at times expressed certain ambivalence about the support that's received for Israel that comes from the Christian right? Um, we welcome it as long as it's not conditioned, in the sense that um, their support is I don't believe, genuine in terms of their belief, I think Israel is part of their theology. The second coming depends on Jews being in a sovereign land, which is wonderful. God bless. I remember once a conversation with Menachem Begin, Oliver Shalom, who was out to speak in Texas at a mega church. And uh, we sat in Ishmus and he said to me, um, <laughs> why are the Jews so upset? I said, well, because, you know, they're waiting for Messiah and they need us for Messiah. And Bacon said to me, well, you know, they're waiting, I'm waiting, they're waiting for the second coming, I'm waiting for the first coming, we'll worry about it when it happens. <laughs> Meanwhile, so my, my, the only reservation I have had is from time to time you've heard from evangelical leaders, you know, we support Israel, therefore, therefore don't criticize us for this, support our social agenda. We heard it during the Mel Gibson situation. How dare you criticize Mel Gibson in this film and the passion of Christ? After all, we love Israel. So if it becomes a prid pro quo, we reject it. But I think on the whole, John is right. They, it's their theology. It's their needs. It's their standard. It's their values. They love us unconditionally. And, you know, listen, in this world, there aren't too many people who love us unconditionally. <laughs> we don't have the luxury to say that. You know what? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> to finish the, ba the Bacon story, um, so <laughs> what happens when, when he comes or she comes? When you, ask, when you ask, is this your first or second coming? <laughs> so the Batran would say, tell him to say, I forgot. <laughs> because God forbid, can you imagine one or the other answer, we'd have a war. <laughs> there was a, I remember, there was a reception at the Blair House, and uh, Jerry Falwell and Menachem Begin, and Epi Avron, who was then the Israeli ambassador, he told me the story, and uh, Falwell was explaining what will happen the second coming, and said, and the Jews all have to come to Israel, and then they have to convert, or they perish. And Begin said, we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> Reminded <laughs> earlier when when uh, when Richard said, "Well, I don't know if we should have taken Mersheimer and Walt so seriously." I'm wondering now that you reminded us of the ADL's position against the Passion of the Christ. I know that there was a period of time during the that the making of that film and the presentation of that film. Uh, should we have gotten so heated about? I mean, if we think about Gip, Mel Gibson's amount of energy that was expended on Mel Gibson and Louis Farrakhan. Two guys that seem to cause you a great deal of headaches, and should we have taken them so seriously? Okay, uh, you know, you asked me, and the answer is absolutely yes, for us. Why? <laughs> Why is it that in America, um, we, our Constitution says you can have bigots, and we have less bigots, whereas in Europe you have laws that say you can't be a bigot and you have more bigots? And that's the difference in our society. <laughs> we put a price on bigotry, not necessarily in, in, by legislation, although hate crimes legislation says if you, if you commit arson because of hate, your punishment is twice if you committed arson for insurance. But that's because that's a message to our society. 
that it has a value. Why Gibson and why? Mel Gibson was, at the moment that, that he got involved with, with the, the passion, people's choice, he was voted by the American people as the number one celebrity, number one actor, one, um, number one director, one, number one producer. When he finally revealed himself as an anti-Semite, first in the film and later in his behavior, the beauty of America came out. And what happened to him is he went from here to here. But in order for that to happen is you have to expose it. You have to continuously say this is un-American, un-Christian, immoral, undemocratic. It's not what America is for. It doesn't happen automatically. Louis Farrakhan is still a Pied Piper in the African-American community. We don't have time to talk about more statistics. But just like this statistic of Jews more loyal, there's a very, very haunting statistic. In the last 30, 40 years, anti-Semitism in the African-American community hasn't changed. It's 35, 40% for us because there is no leadership. There is no moral standard since Martin Luther King. Martin Luther King was the last African-American leader who said anti-Semitism is a sin. What you have is silence and Louis Farrakhan. And therefore, every time Louis Farrakhan blames all the ills on the Jews, we need to challenge it. We need to say, this is not going to get you jobs. This is not going to protect you against drugs. This is not going to make your life better. He's a bigot. And we have to make sure that there is a consequence out there. That it, you can't, it is, a, you know, people said to me, oh, you made, you made Mel Gibson's film popular. Nonsense. Yeah, I asked maybe a thousand rabbis to go see it because I think it was important for Jewish leadership to see and understand. But do you know what? The Passion of the Christ today is an educational vehicle in hundreds, if not thousands, of Christian schools. That's the vehicle of the Passion that's being <coughs> used. This is the film. That's poisoning minds. And the other statistic is 30% of the American people, despite Vatican II, despite interfaith, despite Cardinal Dolan, still believe the Jews killed Christ. I just want to say- You, um, you do? Yeah, no, I don't. <laughs> I, I, I don't, and, and my family was there. So, uh, but Abe and, Abe and I bonded over Farrakhan years ago. Uh, I did a lot of work on him, because I was in Washington, and there were hate rallies at, at Howard University, which I covered, which was very frightening because this was a, a major institution, and turning himself over to an anti-Semite for a hate rally, and Jews were being denounced from the stage, and I was sitting there, um, and it was scary. It was just plain scary. I felt like I was all of a sudden in Germany in a bad period. And um, I felt good at that time, because I was always citing the ADL. I mean, I was saying, ADL says this, and the ADL was, I was quoting Abe a lot. I, I used to quote Dr. Ruth a lot, <laughs> but, uh, right, but, but is she the king of the Jews? Yeah, right. Um, but it was very scary. And the thing that, the thing that I remember uh, from that period was that not only was black anti-Semitism considerably greater than non-black anti-white, but the scary thing was that it wasn't older blacks. In, in the general community, the older you are, the less educated you are, the more you can tend to be anti-Semitic. In the black community, it was younger people. And that's what I was seeing at, at Howard University. And that's why it was so important to fight. And I found it in the newsroom of the Washington Post. I found, you know, in, among my black colleagues, I could not take for granted that they thought that Farrakhan was a buffoon, a racist, an anti-Semite, and, and, and an idiot. Uh, but no, they respected him. Some of them, I'm not, I, you can't generalize. Some, some thought he was no, no differently than I did. So I mean, that's. I was, I was very grateful for Abe, but those, I still am grateful for Abe. I mean, it was a very strange period. You know, we passed it, and it's one of the, you know, it's one of the, the, the very positive aspects of, of, of the current presidency, that it has put a certain quality of uh, incendiary leadership uh, really to, to, to bed, and I think forever. But, you know, remember, the most important black leader in the United States in 1984 was Jesse Jackson, and Jesse Jackson referred to this city as Hymie Town, and he did so in the presence of a Washington Post reporter and editor who showed great courage, he himself being black, showed great courage in revealing that he had, that, that, that uh, 
that Jackson had said this to him as a kind of, you know, brotherly aside. Um, and, but this was, you know, Jesse Jackson won, you know, what, nine primaries in, in won a couple of caucuses in 84. I mean, he was a major American political figure and he, brought, he opened the door and cleared the path for more radical, more irredentist, more anti-Semitic leaders, Sharpton in this city and C. Vernon Mason and Farrakhan. And it was a horrifying um, explosion of, of, of anti-Semitic attitudes from people from whom, from whom the Jews had absolutely no reason to expect any hostility. I mean, even the classic rules the governing supposed you know, hostilities between blacks and Jews, that Jews were shopkeepers in black neighborhoods and that sort of thing had long since been passed. This was almost theoretical and, and ideological. It wasn't, it wasn't based on, you know, frictions, present frictions between people living cheek by jowl, you know, in, in, in hostility. Um, and, and this was a very important thing to stand up against it and fight it, and I, much more important than then Mel Gibson, though, I think that was a very notable thing to do, but I mean, that was a sort of cultural, little mini cultural explosion. This was a, this really could have been something that would have, could have dominated American politics without a proper blowback. Judy, John, and Richard, you cover international affairs. Are either of you sitting Shiva for Hugo Chavez? <laughs> um, Hugo Chavez, if I could just say, because yes. I published uh, several articles about this in commentary, Hugo Chavez was, um, a, an enormous threat to a very vibrant Jewish community in, in, in Caracas and used <coughs> Jews as whipping boys and allowed gangs to deface Jewish community centers and synagogues and drove, uh, a, very pro drove a majority of a very prosperous, very settled, very happy community out of of Venezuela, aside from everything else that he did, his relations with Iran and his in his anti his anti Israel sentiment, um, you know, he was a classic example of a leftist demagogue who, for no reason whatsoever, no absolutely no reason except ideological hatred, went after Jews who po who were a who were not who played no real major role in Venezuelan society except a positive liberal role. And the, the legacy continues. There's an election this week, and the anti-Semitism is rife, and he's gone. But in his, in his spirit, it continues. And I think that the anti-Semitism of Chavez and of, that, that you feel enormously, uh, the only time I was down there was to cover the attacks on the, on the uh, Jewish community center. Uh, I think that was an undercovered story in the United States. We talked about Iran. We talked about other things. We talked about his hideous uh, redistributive <laughs> policies, which wound up making a wealthy country poor. But we didn't talk about what was going on within two Jews in, in Venezuela and in other South American countries. Um, and the Times, which was very well positioned to do that, did not do it. And I think that the parade of Hollywood characters going down there and embracing him s sent a very, very pernicious message to Americans. And it's no surprise, because they do that all the time. If someone's anti-American, they must be good. But, uh, but still, this was just stomach churning. This is, this is in the kind of Dennis Rodman uh, category. Uh, <laughs> I mean, but you know, there's a very important and salient point here about the nature of Jew hatred in the 21st century. You have enormous swaths of the planet that have largely now become Judenrein. I mean, the entire Arab world, there are Jews have, have, le have been essentially banished from Arab countries in which they played a significant trading role for hundreds of years. Various other places, Europe, Eastern Europe. And the presence, the lack of presence of Jews has done almost nothing, if, if anything, may even have accelerated the fact that anti-Semitism is on the rise. Now, what explains this? The classic thing would be to say, well, you know, Jew, you know, it's hard, eh, they live there, and eh, they're small, but they have, they have resources, and maybe the people around them aren't as wealthy, or whatever, if that was ever true. But 
Anti-Semitism, as Chavez, is, anti-Semitism is an ideology. It is, not a, it is not a socially disruptive fact. It is an idea about how to explain the world and its injustices and its problems. And the horror of our time is that, is that with a massive reduction in the Jewish population in the 20th century because of a mass murder and all of this, the sentiment and the, and the, and the, ex, and the, ex, the, uh, the, the, uh, the ex-mission of Jews from Arab lands where they were treated hostily has only accelerated this ideology beyond the breaking, you know, beyond, to a threat where it's now beyond the breaking point. We cannot rest. It just means, it just means that there is, this is not going to end. We are not going to see the end of this magically. It's not going to have, the world is not going to progress beyond anti-Semitism. It's too much, too finely ingrained in the consciousness of people. And we have to combat it, fight it, fight for ourselves, fight for Jews everywhere, fight for Jews who are under threat, fight for Jews in Venezuela, fight for Jews in other countries, and fight for Jews in Israel. And that's why I think the ADL is so important. <laughs> Judy, you, 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 Judy, you spoke a moment ago earlier about what's been unreported in the Arab Awakening or the Arab Spring. Do you think what's also being underreported is that there is, there is even an, a greater intensity of anti-Jewish sentiment, anti-Israeli sentiment that we, we're, we either haven't heard about and that we will see and that it's only ennobled people like Ahmadinejad, that his part of the world, even the Persian Gulf, is just in flames with people who just hate Jews? You know, Thane, it's a really good question. I just came back from Egypt, and I, um, because there are no longer any Jews there, I covered the last Jewish wedding in Cairo in wow. 1986, and the two of them actually went to Israel. <laughs> um, but because there are none, at least in Egypt, and because because there are 10% Coptic Christians, the community which is really endangered and which doesn't receive enough publicity are the Coptic Christians. And these are people who are the original Egyptians. Everyone who was a Muslim more or less came afterwards. And this is a very endangered community. Well, I think there's another uncovered <laughs> story, and that's the persecution of Christians. It's true. In, in Asia and in, in, in the Middle East, it's, it's an uncovered story. So yeah, we can, we, can, we can complain and say, you know what, you're not paying attention. But they're not, the media is not paying attention. Christians are being killed. Really? Churches are being blown up because they're churches. There's, there's a religious war. There, there's an exodus. There's an expulsion. And you know what? <laughs> I talk about it more than, than, than even Christians do, but that's an uncovered story. That's not a reported story. And it is, it is a very serious, e Egypt, it's in every country, Iraq. There, was, there were two churches blown up this last Sunday. Iraq, we do read in, about Indonesia, Sunni Shia. Malaysia, Malaysia half Burma. Of, half of the Iraqi Christians have left yeah. in the past. Lebanon, uh, yeah. there was a story about Gaza. You know, the restrictions on Christians in Gaza. Mm -hmm. That's not a reported story. And, 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 and go ahead, I was going to say the Richard. terrible thing mm -hmm. is this sort of parochial comment is that these reported uh, for, uh, these stories will be, get reported less and less because there's less and less real media. That's uh, right. You know, I mean, the New York Times, the Washington Post, they don't have the foreign staff they used to have. Uh, they don't have the travel budgets they used to have. They don't, the paper isn't as big as it used to be. There's going to be less and less. And a lot of this is going to take place in the dark. And you go back to the time when you could murder whole villages and nobody would know about it. And, and we're, we're, we're arriving there pretty quickly. I'm going to take some questions from the audience, but I, I just I can't help but I can't resist asking this one last one. Um, then we'll cover to the questions from the audience. We have three journalists and a Foxman here. Uh, it's been. Ten and a half years since Danny Pearl was decapitated in Pakistan. Uh, I can tell you, I, w I organized the first yurt site for him here in New York City. Uh, there wasn't a second. There wasn't a third. Uh, I wasn't sure if I tried to do it again, anyone would even remember. Uh, speaking as three journalists, here was a Jew who was covering post 9 11 uh, 
uh, world uh, in Pakistan. He was, went to report on a story. He's a Wall Street Journal reporter. He's kidnapped and, and beheaded. Of course, he most you know, infamously was recorded, not just the beheading, but his own last statement in which he said, I am Jewish. And that, in fact, uh, led to uh, a book entitled I Am Jewish to try to memorialize this experience. Do you think that ultimately has been underreported, that somehow the killing of Danny Pearl just got blended in within all the post-9-11 outrages and that we haven't really spent any time about a very specific Jewish crime that took place in the aftermath of 9-11? Well, I think the danger is the transformation of uh, what used to be opposition to Israeli policies into hatred of Jews because of the rise of militant extremist Islam. That's the biggest change in my lifetime and in covering. I mean, when I went to Egypt in, 19, in the 70s, when I first went, it was considered impolite to talk about Jews. You could talk about Zionists. You could criticize Zionist policy, but you couldn't talk about Jews. There was something left over from the thought that these people used to be part of our community. No. And however badly we treated them, we don't do this. That's gone. And when I wrote my book about the rise of militant Islam in 1996, the hatred of Jews was a major feature of it because you could see this transformation because hatred of Jews led to hatred of Christians, hatred of the others, never mind if you're a Baha'i or not a person of the book. I mean, it's really a huge transformation. So in that sense, that he was forced to say that, that Danny was first to, forced to go through that, yes, that is reflective of a much bigger problem that we're going to have to contend with. I, uh... I, I went all through Lebanon uh, with the PLO, and they used to kid me. They would say, ah, Kohane, you know, and they would say like, and, but I never felt a moment of like they were not intimidating, they were not threatening me. I was, you know, I was just a reporter for, uh, for the Washington Post, but they knew who I was, but I wasn't scared. I wouldn't do it now. No. I would not go there. I mean, no, no. it's just not. Yeah. Well, and then there was the startling, beautiful, startling, thing that Abe, that Ed Koch did on his tombstone. Yes. That Ed Koch put, I am a Jew, my mother is a Jew, my father is a Jew, Daniel Pearl on his tombstone. So we were reminded just a couple of months ago, out of nowhere, by a very generous and loving man, man who was a real defender of his people, to remember that in the end, we are all at risk of being Daniel Pearl. Uh, Thane, I, um, I, don't, I don't see it the way. I, I think it, he is being remembered. Um, there, are, there are concerts, because music was one thing that he cared about. Uh, and there are concerts annually all over the, the world in memory of Danny Pearl. There are awards we issue. We give an award every year to a journalist who's shown courage, possibly in the, in the Muslim Jewish thing. Uh, so there are, there are events. I think the, a lot of the schools of journalism have established courses in his memory and, and awards. So I, I, I think there, the journalist community, uh, it was touched by one of its own. And I think it, it took on a greater life, if you will, on the issue. Uh, by the way, uh, if you talk to his parents, they are convinced and that, that Danny was not forced to say these sentences, that this was Danny Shema Yisrael, that uh, when he realized, uh, you know, so he, he volunteered, uh, my mother's, I am a Jew, my mother is a Jew, my father, that was his Shema Yisrael. Yeah, but there's one yep. piece of that speech that is troubling, Abe. Yeah. Halfway into his final words, he says, there is a street named after my grandfather in, in, in Jerusalem. In Jerusalem. Yeah. And that is more troubling, the fact that he, that he either said that because he thought that was important to say, that there's a something Pearl Street in Jerusalem, or that that, for them, was, took him out of the category of being Richard Cohen, who trailed around with a PLO, that if you have a street named after your family in Jerusalem, you will lose your head today. But I think there is, there is an important, you know, lesson for all Jews, and it gets to the threat to Israel from Iran, you know, 70 years after the Holocaust. 
Jews are at risk of being killed because they are Jews, and every Jew in the world must live and think as though he might be one of them. If he does not do so, if he believes, as, you know, as, as, as we said last week, if he sets himself apart from the community and so denies God, you shall set his teeth on edge. I don't think any of us could have dreamed that in Europe, rabbis and politicians would advise Jews not to be identifiably Jewish. Non-Jews are attacked in the streets of Europe because somebody thinks they look like Jews. That parents are telling their kids to hide the stars of David, that Jews remove their, their mezuzahs, that a major ritual today in almost every single synagogue on the continent of Europe is security. You walk in, there are color codes, what doors you would go to. You cannot enter a Jewish institution without going through megometers and frisking. No Jewish institution. You know what? You want to know what a Jewish institution is? You sometimes can't tell by the facade anymore. Is If you see a couple of security, usually Israeli or Jewish kids, plus a gendarme, you know it's a Jewish... Could we have imagined that 70 years after Auschwitz, this is what Europe would be? Forget about Tehran, forget about Cairo. We're talking about London, Paris, Brussels, Antwerp. This is, this is a reality that I don't think any of us could have imagined would be part of our agenda and part of our reality. We wouldn't have imagined it 15 years ago, I don't um, think. What a before we say goodnight, I want to take at least one question from the audience. Uh, this is <laughs> symbolic. I know I, I know I promised to do it earlier, and I just the thing just got endlessly interesting. Um, so here's this is from here. It's not from one of our satellite cities. Uh, this says, uh, "What about the UN's blatant anti-Semitism?" This is I, I know I asked this question as if we can wrap this up in a minute or so. But <laughs> there will be quite a challenge. I'm afraid to even introduce John Podhorts into this one. <laughs> And just, just Judy. Judy, <laughs> what do you think? What about the UN's blatant anti-Semitism? You, you, know. you could even throw in the Durban conference. Pro or con? <laughs> Pro or con, right? I'm against it. Okay. <laughs> no, I mean, you know, look, it's, uh, it's, it's an institution utterly, totally out of control on this subject. It is appalling. It remains appalling. And I'm just... Uh, uh, I hope that when we're considering our cutbacks, and I hate to say this because I schlepped around so often with UNICEF and with uh, some of the other great UN agencies which do great work, but to hear again and again uh, these slogans and these resolutions, after a while you just say, you know, UN, I'd love to introduce you to a word. It's called sequester. <laughs> so I know that may not be charitable of me, but, but it does. It, it, yes, it bothers me. I'm against it. John? Well, I, there's nothing. I mean, it's, it's, it's a subject that is almost impossible to address uh, because, you know, I believe the number is that uh, since the 1970s, in the General Assembly, 40% of the resolutions involve Israel. <laughs> there are 204 nations on this planet. 40% of the resolutions in the body that is supposedly represents all 204 nations involve a country of what is now 8 million people and a planet of 6 billion that is, you know, that is the size of New Jersey. What is it, Massachusetts right. plus, plus Depending Rhode where you draw the borders. Or, borders. or New Jersey. <laughs> New Jersey. New Jersey is the <laughs> Let's say New Jersey and be oh. done with it. <laughs> the global landmass of the earth versus New Jersey and six and eight million out of six billion. That's psychotic. There's no other word for it. It's psychotic. But you know, it's, 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 also, it's not even a reflection of the world's reality, which was pretty bad. It's, it's beyond that. That means not, not even if you look at the reality of the world, they don't like Israel, nah, nah, but there's still a different balance. It is so skewed, it is so perverted in that institution. So sequester, is that it? <laughs> I, Richard, I assume you're against it. Can I think about it? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I don't get it. I mean, I do get it. I do understand that I think it's reprehensible and, and juvenile. And what amazes me is they don't get it. 
I mean, they really think they're making political statements or ideological statements. They look silly and stupid. Um, but I'm with Judy. I would like to squeeze it a little bit, but keep the good programs. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. and, but it's very hard to figure out how to do that. And by all means, I want to save the UN bureaucracy because <laughs> cause it's important to the city of New York, right? right. <laughs> and, and major restaurants on the east side. <laughs> Just unleash the NYPD and say, you know, those tickets we're not giving right. you, yes. we're going to start giving them to you and see how many people. <laughs> Abe, Abe, you and I have been on this stage many times before. Uh, and I'll tell you what I look forward to. Your 100th birthday. Here, here. Sitting with us right here. <laughs> Let us thank Richard Cohen, John Todd Horitz, Judy Miller, and of course, a force of nature, Abe Foxman. <laughs>